91.3 WVKR Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York. We just heard, did you ever have to make up your mind, Mr. John Sebastian? And this is off his new release. We've got so much to talk about. We've got him on the line. Let's get him on air. John? Yes. Hello. We're on air. How are you, I'm doing well. So nice to have you here today. I'd like to do a brief introduction, if I may. I'll yes. start off by saying legendary singer, songwriter, musician John Sebastian is best known as a founder of the group The Love and Spoonful, among one of many of his career accomplishments. He also wrote the number one hit, Welcome Back, for the 1970s TV show Welcome Back, Cotter. John was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2000 and inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 2008. He's just released a new album with guitar maestro Arlen Roth titled John Sebastian and Arlen Roth Explore the Spoonful, the Spoonful Songbook, and will be performing in Woodstock on December 3rd at Bearsville Theater. It's an oh, honor wait, to... Wait, 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 wait. That's not Arlen and me, though. That's my jug band. Just so yes, get yes, confused. yes, exactly. And I was going to talk about that. Yes, the release is with you in Arlen, but your show is not with Arlen. That's a jug band, and that's happening on December 3rd at Bearsville Theater. And with that, I'll start off by saying it's an honor to have you on the show today, Mr. John Sebastian. Well, thanks very much. Yeah. Glad to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So just to clear that up so nobody has any um, in anything incorrect here yes you are playing december 3rd and that is with your jug band you're going to be joined by cindy cash dollar uh paul rochelle steve boone jimmy vivino and maybe even a special guest or two so that's happening tickets available now at bearsvilletheater.com and that's on december 3rd john sebastian and is let's that- us folkies not forget james wormworth Oh, oh full drummer. <laughs> okay. Yes, let's not forget that. That's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to try my best to get to that show. I don't think I want to miss that one. So, wonderful. All right. So, if we may start off in the beginning just a little bit because boy, it was so much fun doing my homework for you. Um I've obviously I've heard I think all of your music, most of it, right? But just to learn a little bit more details, um it was so cool. I um I, I'll, I went to leave on Helm Studios a few weeks ago to see Larry and Teresa, and they played one of your songs, the song that you played at Woodstock. And um, I didn't realize that Woodstock story until Larry told it at the show that day, at the, you know, leave on's the other day. So um, that was pretty incredible. And um, yeah, so we've got lots to sink into. Let's just start from the beginning. So you grew up in a pretty cool place, is that correct? Greenwich Village? I, I grew up right in the beating heart of Greenwich Village. Uh, I was sort of on Bank Street and then 10th Street and then Dad somehow talked his way and charmed his way into the 15th floor of Washington Square West. Wow. Which essentially meant that I could listen out the window, and when I heard the conga start on Sunday, <laughs> I knew that, that you know that's when the uh, the big folk scare was uh, in full bloom right in there. I mean, you could not have been you could not have been in a better place to grow up and then follow the path that you did. And I understand your dad was a classical harmonica player. That's right, that's right, an amazing virtuoso, uh, unappreciated in our country, but uh, lauded in uh, many Latin countries in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, interesting. And your mom was a writer of radio spots or shows. That's right, so that's that's where you get the funny. Wow. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely, wow. And... Now, your dad seemed to have had some pretty cool friends, like you had some interesting people come to your home, somebody such as Burl Ives? Yes, that's right. Uh, Burl was a a family friend, you know, it wasn't anything of, uh, like, let's have a a star over or anything. Burl uh, simply uh, had through a number of probably gigs. Wow. um, Because... uh, between uh, some of the clubs that Dad was playing during that era downtown that he would 
very often be co-billed with Josh White, for example. I, I was playing with Josh Jr. on the floor of a green room, I think, before I was six. Oh, my. Wow. What was your first instrument, John? Well, I guess it probably was a harmonica because my dad would go to Trussingen to refine this uh, uh, 64 chromatic uh, instrument that, that has become the standard. Uh, but as he was walking out the door, they would always hand him a double handful of the toys, essentially <laughs> marine bands. That's what I still play to this day. Wow, wow. When did you pick up the guitar? I think that started at about 12. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I borrowed a friend's uh, sister's classical guitar for the weekend because I knew how to play E minor. <laughs> and by the end of the week, when I returned it to her, I had invented D major. <laughs> and I was just dying to tell the world that I'd found a new chord. <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's great. And because you were in the village, you had you were there at the beginning of all this, you know, coffee shop and the whole folk scene there, right? That's right. Yes, it really had begun just before me, my father's generation. Uh, 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 I can't help not mention Saro Murabito, who is the, uh, uh, the blue-eyed Sicilian that opened up the Peacock Cafe, which really was the dawn of the coffee shop uh, world there, except for one place that was distinctly Italian, uh, right there on uh, McDougal Street. Oh, wow, wow, interesting. Now, I know, like, I've had your friend Happy Traumont several times. Did you guys know each other back then? You know, we did cross paths before we both became blood brothers up here in Woodstock. Uh, he, he, uh, he really also, he, he precedes me by a, uh, a few years and mm -hmm. a few uh, really important, you know, folk, uh, uh, just moments when folk music was changing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you think about it. He says, let's record this thing blowing in the wind. It's this yeah. guy. Nobody knows him, but no, let's do it. Yeah. I just, I love that. <laughs> yeah, that was such a great story. I always feel like when he's been on, I've gotten a history lesson in folk music. In, and in, indeed you are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We all are. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, you started playing coffee houses, from what I understand, by the age of 16, and by the age of 18, you were already recording. Well, you know, the, uh, I, I don't know how early I, it, I may be 16, but yes, I was recording by, by 18 because there weren't any harmonica players in the village. Yeah. You know, I thought my first instrument was guitar, but my God, after you'd heard Danny Kalb, that just ruined your whole day. And then people <laughs> like uh, Stefan Grossman, who had completely absorbed uh, Reverend Gary Davis yeah. and so many great guitarists. So, so uh, I, I kind of felt like, now nah, I'll just keep developing my skills on yeah. this guitar. And meanwhile, I do have a thing that I've been playing for a very long time. Yeah, yeah, that was a smart thing. Um, it worked out very well for you. Um, I love the name of the one of, the, I believe, one of your first groups, Mugwumps. The Mugwumps were uh, absolutely a, uh, a developing, uh, it was like the dawn of folk rock, but not quite right yet. <laughs> uh, what it was was uh, that I had enjoyed some time with Cass Elliott, who had been in a group called the Big Three, and uh, to, you know, it was like hearing Ronnie Gilbert for the first time. It really put you back against the wall. And uh, uh, but I quickly became friends with her. I was an accompanist opening for uh, Valentine Pringle. There's a, a, a an obscure one. 
Uh, a, a, a Harry Belafonte protege, however, oh. uh, who uh, who I got my first uh, guitar job with, and so that is what took me to Washington, where the Big Three were playing at the cellar door quite regularly. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. And the Mugwumps was with um, would have been your cohort for Spoonful too, right, Sal? As it turned out, yes, absolutely. And in fact, uh, uh, Cass was trying to sell me on Yanovsky. You know, always the, the, when you find out who got this group together, you'll eventually come back to Cass Elliot. <laughs> and it's the same for us, too, Aww. because she did indeed uh, just start hounding me. Oh, you have to meet this guy, Yanovsky. This is the coolest guy. And, of course, I, I indeed... Love the guy to death, and uh, and with you know within a year the Mugwumps had kind of evaporated. Uh, I'd gotten a chance to play with him for a couple of weeks because I was invited. You know, after I'd done my job with Valentine, uh, Cass said, "Look, could you come back? Uh, you know, maybe play with the Mugwumps for a couple of weeks, mostly on harmonica." And bring us an ounce of pot. <laughs> Did you do that? <laughs> I, I brought him a pound. There you go. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. And during this time before, I, from what I understand, the full formation of Love and Spoonful, you had a little session work with Bob Dylan. Yes, it, it is, I guess, technically a little session work with Bob Dylan. It was a fast invite that came uh, and uh, I showed up knowing very little of, of what might be uh, uh, needed, and I was handed a bass, an instrument that I'm oh. <laughs> particularly uh, unskilled in, and uh, I did a, a tune or, or two. Uh, and then, uh, uh, because Steve Boone knew about this session, that this is the Spoonful's wonderful bassist, uh, I said, uh, you know, uh, Steve is here now, Bob, and Steve actually plays the bass. Wow, wow. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So you switched okay. it over? Yeah so, yeah, so then he did a couple of takes of something or another, and then we just finished that when Harvey Brooks showed up, and Harvey, I mean, the minute we saw Harvey... Both Steve and I went to Bob and said, now look, now we have like a session guy bass player here. So me and Steve are both going to step back. And so Harvey did a couple of takes too. Right. And to wow. this day, I have no idea what tapes and what takes uh, ended up, you know, being used on an album or eventually some of these uh, uh, you know, box sets or something. Yeah, yeah. these latter day, every golden moment kind of day uh, CDs. You know, right, right, right. But then, of course, the the start of the spoonful and your first single. I mean, my goodness, everyone in the world still knows it. Fifty five years later, do you believe in magic? And we could not get a single record company what? in New York City, think how many there were, yeah. to uh, call that our first single and make us their their guys. Wow, they must be kicking themselves after that one. Meh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. And, and then, I mean... The songs, one after the other, after the other. Like I said, we all still know them. They're not going anywhere. It's kind of like knowing Beatles tracks. It's the same thing. You're the American version, the love and spoonful. We all know these mu this music. It's it's just, it's an amazing 50-something years later. And wow, talk about more of your time and how the writing just comes. It just seems so easy to you. I mean... Well, you know, remember that, that, that I had been kind of practicing at it for several years, just in the process of being in these jug bands, 
And one of the things, as you know from listening to things like the Harry Smith catalog and uh, 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 instrumental music of the Southern Appalachians, you know those those mm-hmm. CDs there. Yeah, uh, that that really taught us all a lot about that kind of thing. Oh, wow! And the spoonful on Ed Sullivan. Amazing. And we were all ready to trash Ed Sullivan. We're going, oh, man, you know, he doesn't know where it's at. You know, yeah, we're going to do his, to his show. It's the biggest thing in life. And, yeah, but, damn, you know, it would be too bad to, we couldn't have, like, Bruce Morrow or somebody who actually knows about the music. Now we get on the set. We get on the set. Ed comes out. And does five minutes of the same kind of thing that you did for an introduction for me. And he's saying, and this is, you know, this is our American answer yep. to the English invasion. <laughs> I forget what his words were, but he, he nailed it for like what we wished somebody would say. Right. <laughs> so I, forever after, my hat is still off to Ed. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I beg forgiveness, <laughs> doubting him. <laughs> Is that stuff online, John? The the Ed Sullivan appearances by you guys? I don't know. You know, the, those are things that are co- held quite close to the chest. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, so I don't know whether it gets put up on YouTube and then gets taken down and then put up again or, well, you know, how one might turn that up but uh, uh certainly I, I i did catch catch us on one of those uh uh you know replays that uh-huh. they did recently they've, they've had the ed sullivan show on conventional television wow yeah yeah it's pretty cool to see that after the fact um and then hit after hit again you don't have to be so nice daydream did you ever have to make up your mind do you believe in magic of course the first one summer in the city i mean non-stop non-stop and then from what i understand your your music was also on some soundtracks that's right films. yes uh uh and it, it happened in the oddest and kind of most conventional way that our manager was good friends with Woody Allen's manager. Mm-hmm. And he and Woody Allen's manager said that Woody was complaining he was having trouble finding music for this oddball. Uh, it's a, uh, for folks who don't know what this was, it was a Japanese spy movie that had been redubbed by, by Woody and, uh, oh, I'm reaching for the name of his girlfriend, wonderful actress. Mia Farrow? No. No, before. Way before. Yeah. Diane Keaton? No, funny Jewish. Don't know. Honking. <laughs> uh, but, you know, she had this great, probably still does, vocal quality that, that was great fun to... I could see how he could work off of her very easily. Anyway, (laughs) uh, so that particular movie, which was originally called Pow, and I had dutifully gone and written a song called Pow, which I thought, how the hell do you write a song called Pow? (laughs) And then at the last minute, they changed it. Luckily, lucky for you. (laughs) Right, right, right. And was that your first time writing for a soundtrack? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then you also did another one, the spoonful with uh, Francis Ford Coppola. You're a big boy now. Yes, that's right. And that really was an education. Uh, Woody Allen kind of hung back and didn't really give us much uh, feedback. But uh, Coppola was like the opposite. He he would just talk about okay, now here's this scene. All right, so we need. I don't know, something like, you know, like Monday, Monday, you know, that kind Uh of tempo. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he's, remember, his dad is a marvelous musician, Mm -hmm. composer, conductor. Yeah, Yeah. because wasn't he playing in the city every Monday night? 
I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, yeah, I think so, and I think so. And then Woody Allen was had a gig or something too every every Monday night, and he was playing for a long time. I think maybe in the eighties or nineties or something like that. I remember hearing about that. And he lanes, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly, and um, yeah. And then in you started working. I love this story. Um, in 1968, you started working some solo material, and then started having a little connections to CSN, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Yes, uh, and that really just happened because of uh, friendship. I guess uh, mostly, uh, you know, for for me, it had been with Stephen Stills. Uh huh. Yeah. And uh, so when that group began to, well, you know, the the sequence was. Uh, I'm one of the people who heard them uh, sing in Cass Elliott's pool. <laughs> and uh, actually, I think my, I might have heard them when they were still a duo, because I remember me and Cass having this conversation. Of, who, who do you add? Right. It's, it's got to be either like Phil Everly or isn't that guy Graham Nash? Isn't he? Wouldn't he do it? And, and we were like talking like that. You know, wow. Wow. So mm. when that group actually began to uh, need to uh, rehearse and become a group, I encouraged them to leave Los Angeles for a while because I really felt like they were getting uh, the, the full massage from, uh, from Hollywood and not letting them step back and do the hard work mm-hmm. of, of, you know, the composing and and arranging and in fact i had recently bought a place out in sag harbor that had a a garage that i converted into a kind of a rehearsal room and it had a drum kit and a couple of amps in it and uh so the guys came up to sag harbor and rented some joints and they were trying out uh harvey brook and uh, see how Harvey is. He's kind of our zealot. He reappears in almost everything. <laughs> uh, and uh, Paul Harris, wonderful keyboardist who later would join Stephen uh, in Manassas. Wow. wow. Uh, and uh, so uh, as they worked out some of these arrangements, there was one afternoon where they were just working on vocal stuff. And Steve, I think, was playing a guitar unamplified, and I started just thumping along on this drum kit that was, I, I'm a bad uh, drummer that, that enjoys uh, having a kit when I can. Uh-huh. So I, you know, had a kit set up, and I started just uh, playing with my hands and, and feet and not really using sticks or anything. And, and kind of Steve, like percussion. Yeah, and, but what was fun was that you know Stephen uh, always a kind of a, 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 a he 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 sets a flame uh, all of a sudden. That's uh, that's his temperament, mm-hmm. and uh, he he stopped singing and said, "We don't need a drummer that goes boom bap boom boom bap. <laughs> we this this is perfect." This we know we can play this whole idea of the acoustic guitars being to the fore could still be the case. This is remember now that very early on the the concept really started as as uh, very much of a, I guess you could call it a rock and roll folk group where they really would be uh, minimally accompanied beyond. Stephen and David's guitars, and and I, I'm sure Willie's at some point uh, as well. Um, so uh, that little five minutes happened, yeah. and then everybody went on doing whatever we were doing. It was not an idea that had, you know, much uh, 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 longevity mm-hmm. other than the fact that Stephen was going, hey, you know. We'd have another vocalist, or we'd have another voice on the bottom, or, hey, you know, and more songs, because we'd have another songwriter. And he, he pitched it very well for the 
about five minutes, right. and then we passed a joint and went back <laughs> with whatever we were doing. <laughs> Oh, man. I was born too late. I'm telling you, this is good stuff. <laughs> Just about 10 years too late. Oh, man. Um, also, you wrote some songs for Broadway, right? Jimmy Shine? Yes. Uh, yeah. Dustin I, I Hoffman? Really, I really wanted to do more for Broadway uh, in that situation. Uh, I was taken into the producer's office and quickly told, now this is not a musical. Mm-hmm. Whereupon I said, "Oh well, don't worry. I I'm used to working with three other guys. I mean, it's it's a four piece band. That's all I use." Right. And they go, "Could you do it with three? <laughs> and that was when I started to realize the atmosphere for for what was going on. Mm-hmm. But uh, I did have some, uh, you know. Gee, I had John Scholl. Uh, I had Kenny Altman. Uh, I had some good players, uh, and uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm reaching for the name of the oh, the guy that played the sheriff in Blazing Saddles. Oh, um, I see him, but I can't think of him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's really embarrassing. Anyway. Yeah. No, it's not. You'll cut, you cut, you cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, we're live, so that's that is what it is. Um, <laughs> it's okay. It's all okay. Um, so again, when I was at Levon's a couple of weeks ago, there's Larry and Teresa for the first time playing together in a long time, and he's like telling us this story. It's like, yeah, my friend John Sebastian played this next song at Woodstock and start saying how it was an impromptu experience. I realize you've probably told the story hundreds of times, but if you could share how the hell you got to Woodstock impromptu, that would be so cool. Well, I had been told by Paul Rothschild that it was going to be a thing. And so I went to the Albany airport and by chance happened to spot my old road manager, and what we used to call Schlepper, uh, uh, loading a helicopter, which turned out to be stuff for the Incredible String Band. Uh, and this was an era when I could walk down onto the tarmac and talk to him, and he says, get in this plane, because there ain't no other way to get there. All the roads are clogged. So I get in the, in the helicopter, and uh, I thought, you know, that's a pretty fast uh, run. I get to, oh boy. Well, you know, I can tell on a folk show that as I'm sitting here in Woodstock, there's a beautiful deer Aww. just taking a little walk on my lawn. Oh, how beautiful. Really nice. Mm. All right, so <laughs> I, get to Woodstock, I get to Woodstock and I kind of wander the first day, and uh, I end up kind of helping uh, because they had a tent that that wasn't being supervised, and so I said, look, put cardboard box outside for the boots, and then you'll have eliminated a problem. The minute that I said that, uh, Chip Monk turned to me and said, you're in charge of the tent. (laughs) (laughs) That's what you get for saying something. And this went, I mean, this was how Woodstock was. Mm. And uh, so the next day, uh, among my wanders on and off the stage, one time I'm there when it's sort of there, they're sweeping the stage off because it had rained and so on. And I'm pretty much center stage with uh, Michael and, and, uh, and Chip Monk, and I'm um, listening to them talking, going, so, uh, you know, what we need is uh, we need to get a guy who, like, could hold them with an acoustic guitar, because we can't put electric instruments on this stage with all of this water until we sweep it all. Mm. Okay, yeah, that's what we got to do, and I'm, I'm kind of agreeing. <laughs> I haven't looked at either guy, and I'm, yeah, that, that's pretty much, the, that's the idea. Wow. And then I turn either way and I, it was like a take in a in a slapstick movie uh because it literally i went guys i don't even have a guitar here and michael leans in in that inevitable calm voice and says 
well, John, you had several minutes to find an acoustic guitar. <laughs> and uh, so at that point, I ran down into the sort of basement of that structure that had been hastily assembled. And there's Timmy Harden lying on his back, and he's got a Harmony Sovereign right next to him. And I said, Tim, uh, I really need to borrow a guitar. And uh, uh, Timmy was perfectly happy to do that. I was lucky the guy is not somebody who, uh, you know, coveted particular instruments and that kind of thing. And how many songs did you play on the stage? I know, I, I know, Darlin' Be Home Soon. Any others? You know, uh, <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> well, it was probably six or seven or oh. five or six or something like that. Oh. I've, I've, heard, I've had different people tell me how many songs <laughs> I sang, and several of them are wrong because they heard the movie, which is incomplete, or the album, which is also incomplete. That's ah, right, 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 yeah, right. You know, they, well, I have to tell you, when I was doing my homework, the video of you doing Darlin Be Home soon uh, in Woodstock is on YouTube. Not surprised, yeah. Yeah, you with your tie-dye, and you just looked so happy, and you looked so at ease, but I guess you'd already been on big stages, but that was a pretty, you know, what, three, four hundred thousand people. It didn't seem to phase you. But you're the first person to get it in one, which is that it's the case for all of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, Crosby, Stills, Nash managed to make <laughs> as much as they could out of it. But look, we'd all been on stages mm -hmm. and had, you know, whether it was 12 or 30 or 400 people, yep. we'd had that experience. And that was a particularly intimate situation. That's the thing that's easy to miss watching the movie, right. was that it had an intimacy to it. Right, right, right. And it really did. It did. I mean, while it was vast and everybody always do, does the overhead shots and you see people until you can't anymore, it, there was, it did seem, I don't know, like you said, it really did seem that, that it definitely had some intimacy. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. What a it, beautiful it, memory. Intimate and, and intimate at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I can get that. I can get that. Now, what you first came to Woodstock, as in real Woodstock, town of Woodstock, when Bob Dylan was living there. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, yeah, he invited me to come up and spend a week or so with the, he and Albert uh, at Albert Grossman's house, at where he was... Had his sort. He was sort of camped out at Albert's uh, guest room upstairs, and uh, so I did spend that week. Uh, uh, is being introduced to Woodstock really, and uh, that is actually well documented by this uh, uh, photographic book called Forever Young, ah. in in which a uh, uh, a uh, photographer was given the assignment by, what, what was it, a uh, magazine that no longer exists. Okay, okay. Uh, that, uh, anyway, he was given this assignment to photograph this new folk singer uh, in uh, his native environments, and that was two places, five blocks from my house in Greenwich Village. Uh -huh. So I'm in a lot of those pictures. And then he goes up to Woodstock just as Bob brings me up there. And so I'm in a lot of the pictures that he took uh, of Bob, like, hanging out uh, in Woodstock when he was first here, you know. and, and uh, After the motorcycle accident. Before, before the motorcycle accident. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then what happened? How did you wind up saying, I want to live in Woodstock? Because I know you've been around for a really long time. Well, uh, it, it, it was sort of cumulative. I was uh, uh, taking this constant drive from, by now, Catherine and I were more or less centered in New York. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one or both of us was taking this drive up to the various New England colleges because after Woodstock, 
there was a period of a year where I couldn't even work inside. All the gigs were outside. Mm -hmm. But then after that, it became colleges. Ah, uh uh-huh. And so now I was doing this regular trip up the thruway uh, to whatever, you know, uh, college I was going to play. And every time, it would only be about an hour and a half, two uh, hours when I'd pass exit 19 and go, hey, that's, that's where I went to go to Woodstock, at the, you know, to hang with uh, uh, Albert and uh, G. Uh, you know, I said, you know, we ought to we ought to see what Albert's up to, oh. and and of course, Albert had now. I mean, the coincidence of all of this was so perfect because Albert had by this time really solidified his his footprint in Bearsville, yep. but he had also been you know buying up little properties that came up for sale that he fancied for one reason or another, but he couldn't live in all of them, and he couldn't (laughs) populate them all with his employees. So what did happen was that uh, uh, in in several cases, he would say, well, uh, you and Catherine want to stay in this particular little cabin for the winter? I, I could... You know, it just requires that you keep the fire going so, you know, the pipes don't freeze. Wow. And there were several of these situations. Right, right, right. Wow. And there you are all these decades later. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, it's such a beautiful place, Woodstock. And then, of course, your friends, Happy and Levon, and you've all built, Larry, you've all built such a beautiful friendship together. And that area there is, is, is just absolutely amazing. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, the whole Woodstock thing was great. Now, I was born in the 60s, lived through the 70s as far as growing up. I was a huge fan of, of course, Welcome Back, Cotter. And you were the songwriter, and that was a number one hit for you, Welcome Back. How, yes. how did that come about? Again, the most conventional way. <laughs> and, and by the way, you're not getting this frying eggs noise uh, on your end, right? A little bit, but I think I'm going to be able to tweak that. It's a little, it, it, it is a little strange, but we're getting through it. You sure I shouldn't just call you on an, uh, from another line? Um, you could try that. You could try that if you'd like. That's not a problem. And yeah, why don't we do that? And I'll just hang up on you now, and then you'll call me right back. Go. Okay, bye. Ladies and gentlemen, we are talking with the legendary John Sebastian and um, what a thrill that is. So now we are going to wait for him to call back because I know we do have a little static in the line. I am sorry for that. And let's see what happens when he calls back and we'll try. So, so far, such great information, so much to learn about and founding member Love and Spoonful. And let's get him back on the line. John? John? Hello? Okay. Let us play a track. Hello? All right. I'm going to play a track of music, folks, and we'll be right back. Thanks for tuning in. Local Motion here, John Sebastian, 913 WVKR. Ninety-one three WVKR, John. Ah. All right, hello, 
Hello? John? Yeah, okay. We're going to keep trying here, folks. We're going to keep trying. We, This is live radio, and we're working out some kinks here. Stand, stay tuned. Ninety-one three WVKR. John. John. I am really perplexed. John. Hmm. Hello. John, are you there? Nah. Okay. Let's keep trying. Let's keep trying. I'm gonna put you back to music. Ninety-one three WVKR. Let's try. John. John. Ah, something. Hello. John, are you there? Hmm. I don't know what to say other than it's live radio, and we are talking to John Sebastian, or shall I say, trying to talk to John Sebastian. Hello. He's going to try calling back, and we're not going to play music. We're just going to sit tight, folks. Sit tight. This is worth the wait. Mr. John Sebastian will be calling back. We're going to get it together here, and let's say, hold on. All right. I, I'm, are you there? Hi. Oh, okay. Oh, yes, you are, and I'm going to do what I did when we first started. I'll just put you on hold. Then I'm going to press a button. And... Ah, see what the problem is, though. I can't get... Um... All right, folks, we're going to try it. John? No, not there. Okay, let's try it this way. And all right, we're going to keep trying here. Keep trying. I, John? Okay, so you are tuned into 91.3 WVKR. We're trying to get John Sebastian back on the phone. And... I am at a loss for words, but please hold on, folks. This is worth the wait. Hold on, please.
91.3 WVKR. We're still trying. It's just hang on. Thank you. Let's uh, do this. All right, folks, we are going to try to do this in an unconventional way. Sometimes you just have to do things a little differently. John, if you speak loudly, I wonder if they can hear us. Say say something. Yeah, that's not working. Not working. Not working. Not working. Not working. It's not through loud enough. You know what? I'm going to I am going to play a track folks because you guys are so cool and then i john going to tell john to call in in a different number and we're going to get this together thanks everybody for staying tuned with us here i promise this is worth the wait let's take a listen to some music by mr john sebastian here on 91.3 wvkr <music> While wondering what I'm going to do While you are sleeping, am I sleeping too? Well, I'm just sitting here loving you Close my eyes and loving you I'm just sitting back, sitting here loving you I have been wondering just what I would do Just what I would do If I went sleeping had I, not found you. Had I not found you, well I'd be outside finding you, walking all the avenues finding you, but I'm just sitting, sitting back, sitting here loving you. Now the reason never see me running around, fingers on my forehead calm me down, she can't even get me up and on my feet. Take care of some business on the street. I have been walking all my streets along. All my streets along. Keep- Folks, we're tuned into 913 WVKR. We have Mr. John Sebastian back on the phone. John, I think we can hear you now. Well, wonderful. And, and I, let's see, where were we? You wanted to hear the, uh, the story you've the story never told about- before. Well, go back, got it. And, you know, it uh, my manager had a friend in Alan Sachs, who was a co-producer of a show that was being created. It was called Cotter, and they had uh, the people, and they had the script, and I got a call uh, saying, look, the, you know, we're looking kind of a, a New York, uh, flavor for this and, and so uh, we're calling you and we're calling Dion DiMucci. I got, oh good tell me that you got a song from Dion already I'll just jump off a cliff here somewhere <laughs> uh, and so anyway I ended up going in there and of course uh, the, the uh, they showed me a couple of uh, rough cuts of various uh rehearsals and so on and you can see that you know the talent of you know Travolta for sure and uh, oh it was uh, you know it was very evident so anyway um, so I went home with a couple of these scripts and uh, with a you know that old system of putting a couple of boom boxes next to each other not unlike what we're trying here <laughs> And getting 
uh, you know, and getting it to uh, to so that you could double track it. And uh, so by the next morning, I had a kind of a rough version of the song. And I go in, and they're amazed that it had happened so fast. I explained that, uh, you know, uh, this isn't that amazing because I'm dyslexic. So I was one of these... Uh, 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 what do they call them? Uh, I've got the word too, but it's not coming out. I know what you're saying. You were like one of the guys. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. In the show. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, they actually changed the name of the show to include the song title that I'd written, which was Welcome Back. Mm, wow. Wow, yeah, yeah, and the rest is history. Cause boy, Sweet how lo- th- how Sweet how long was that? How how long was that show on for? I'm sweat hogs. That's sweat hogs. That's it. Oh my gosh, I've watched enough episodes. I should have come up with that one. Yes, the sweat hogs. So, uh, yes, and 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 how long did it go? Yeah, I don't know that I'm that sure. I don't know. Uh, how long it did last yeah yeah no i'm not sure either i know it did for quite some time and uh yeah no i i love the song i loved it i loved it i loved the show and boy that's yeah that was a great theme song it was just really well done really well done um i am almost at the end of time and we have so much more that we could talk about i do want to at least talk about this new release that you have with mr arlen roth and also your upcoming show at bearsville theater so this new release just came out in september called john sebastian and arlen roth explore the spoonful songbook and tell us how that came about so uh, Arlen and I have had a friendship that's gone on for probably 40 years. We were, you know, hanging out in pawn shops in New York together because we had very similar uh, techniques for finding very good instruments for very cheap. And uh, we would uh, go to these various pawn shops and all along Second Avenue or way, way downtown and uh, this uh, uh, developed when I moved up to Woodstock. I started seeing him more regularly because for a while he lived nearby and was also a frequent victim when they needed people to play benefits and so on. And we would end up playing together, just sort of being thrown together. And I did notice that, gee, this works rather well. My instincts go towards sort of foundational, and and his goes towards uh, a, a little more finished, a little little more, uh, you know, like it's mm-hmm. got a coat of paint on it. Yeah. So uh, so I uh, had this friendship with him, and then a few years ago, Catherine and I were. Uh, having dinner and we started playing a bunch of Arlen's uh, acoustic Rolling Stones and uh, uh, you know uh, instrumental uh, Simon and Garfunkel both of whom he played with and and he did a Bob Dylan one and I you know so uh, and we're sitting having dinner and reacting to this and it was really marvelous and Next time I saw him, I said, you know, that's a great thing you've got going with those acoustic instrumental renderings and so on. He said, now, wait, you never did this? And I said, no, I've always been afraid of touching the material, you know. He goes, well, uh, we'd already have half the arrangements licked. (laughs) 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 So... That kind of shut my mouth, and we got in the studio pretty quick. And uh, as a byproduct of that, we we uh, uh, met Ira Coleman, or I'd met Ira Coleman uh, previously with an at an Earl Slick uh, session, yep. and just thought the guy had such divine touch. And uh, also, I knew that he'd get along with Eric Parker. 
And so that became a foursome that we made the basic tracks of the entire album. Oh, man. Ira, Ira is, and, is amazing. He's a, an amazing, amazing bassist. And, absolutely. Yeah. And your twist on this, this is really cool. This is all the music I've been playing um, is this new release of you and, and Arlen. So um, I love the way it sounds and the way that it came out. And congratulations to you guys. Um, really well done. Um, I also want to direct people to johnsebastian.com where you can get more information and just get the music it's it's really great and you'll know most every song on there and it's just done so well the two of you together it really looks like you both really thoroughly enjoyed yourself um getting this all done what i also want to briefly talk about is the show that you have coming up at bearsville theater bearsvilletheater.com december 3rd tell us what's going on there please that'll be a lot of fun it's a jug band show uh, nobody needs, nobody additional needs to come because <laughs> there's not many seats. Ah. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to get too deep into that because, I mean, it's going to be great. We're going to have Jimmy Vivino and we're going to have uh, Cindy Cash Dollar and Paul Rochelle and Nanny Rains and James Wormworth and all the cats that were in the original J band that uh, we hadn't really been able to play and tens of years wow and so uh, this, this sounds wonderful and your lovely, lovely wife part. is also quite a talented photographer and i <laughs> understand that there's going to be some photos of hers there as well at the theater that's right yes she's yeah. actually been pulling out some of the amazing documents of that uh, 90s era when we were doing all of those shows and there's also some shots of Yank, Rachel, our 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 grandpa. He's uh, our jug band grandpa. Oh, nice! Uh, that was so such an amazing uh, event. You know, all of our lives. Right. So yes. yeah, that that's going to go on. That's wonderful. That's beautiful, John. It has been an honor. I've, as I mentioned, I've done almost 300 shows. I've been wanting to have you on the show. You are a legend in the Hudson Valley, in the musical world, and your gift will continue forever. This music that you have written will be alive in a hundred years, and it's been a true honor talking with you for this time and this hour, and I so appreciate your time, and I'm so grateful for it, and um, I wish you all the very best, continued happiness and good health, and thank you for bringing a smile to so many people's lives with all of your music. Well, Rita, thank you for bringing uh, all your listeners uh, right to my doorstep so that they could hear a little bit of this. Well, and uh, my we look forward to uh, uh, being able to uh, play more of it. Yes, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, John Sebastian. <laughs> it's been an honor and a pleasure, and I hope to see you at that show. You take care of yourself. All right. All right. Take care, sir. Bye bye. 91.3 